just ahead on Art Rocks, tracing the legacy of Baton Rouge artist legend Charles Barbier. More than anything, I think Charles loved color. I think that's really what, what drove people to his work. Going in search of a new creative outlet and a memorable motorcade, celebrating the grandeur of days gone by at the Calcasieu Marine Bank in Lake Charles. That's all next on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge, Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank building. And by Prescience Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. The Baton Rouge art community lost one of its giants in 2018, Charles Barbier. Barbier's death sent shockwaves through the capital city, not only on account of his prolific output, prodigious talent and generosity of spirit, but also because of the joy Barbier so obviously took in collaborating with other artists. Two who did were Paul Neff and Rusty Collotta. But before we meet them, take a closer look at Charles Barbier's distinctive work. Jason Anderson, the director of Baton Rouge Gallery, gets us going in the right direction. More than anything, I think Charles loved color. I think that's really what drove his work, what drove people to his work. Beyond that, it was narrative and putting a lot of himself into the work. He'd paint himself into his work, whether it was something that had more of a surrealist bend to it or a painting of a night at his home with friends around. There was so much to be found in his work. Whether you were in an exhibition setting where work is hanging on the wall, whether you're looking at a mural that he's painted on the side of a building here in Baton Rouge, there was plenty to look at and plenty to get lost in. And you could find not only new things, but new relations between things within his work. I still have girls in the pictures on the center stage here. I have the sense, sensations, and the painting's called Sensational. But there's three like energy spots. See down here, every helmet's going in different directions so you can feel the rocking of the huddle here. And then this energy in here is like a little shimmy. And then these hardcore Saints fans really are energetic. Charles was a master of composition and he employed several methods, any method that he could, every method that he could. He was constantly exploring the way he arranged his subject matter on the canvas. When he did have one that he particularly liked, he would take it through various thematic changes. And the three pieces that I brought illustrate that. And it's a painting with a centralized figure whose identity changes throughout the three paintings. A figure over that figure's shoulder on the right, which in the first piece is a portrait of me in high school as a student of Charles's. The figures changed and he put himself as the student, took my place. Drawing was something that Charles was a master at as well and it was something that shouldn't be underestimated in Charles's repertoire. He was drawing before he was painting and I feel that he mastered drawing. There's 
an early drawing dated 1973 done with just ballpoint pens, blue and red. He would draw with the brush. He, he didn't do a lot of pencil sketches on the canvas that I can really think of. He learned to draw with the brush. His references were, were varied from, but primarily photography and books. He would go to the library and check out books on every artist imaginable. He loved children's books for the illustrations. And he carried a camera with him all the time. One of the qualities that I see a lot in Charles's work is just the vast range of emotion. He could have stuff that was really heart-wrenching and brutal all the way to something very whimsical and fun and everything in between. And he would paint stuff from complete reality and real scenes to something completely phantasmic and make-believe. You would see pieces that were fun and lighthearted and easygoing. Then you'd see pieces that tackled injustices that he saw in the world. And those pieces were different. You would get a different sense, a different feel, depending on what he was trying to communicate. So you might have one piece with uh, aliens and barbecues and, you know, who knows what. But then you'd have pieces that were painted maybe following the flooding in New Orleans, following Hurricane Katrina that were much more somber and much more intended to drive home a point about what happened in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. He was also a veteran, so his experiences following the Vietnam War heavily influenced his work. And he had a lot of feelings about the war and about war in general that he did not shy away from in terms of putting into his work and, and trying to communicate those feelings. The Vietnam War really stuck with him through the years. That was, I'm sure, very hard for him to go through, especially being the kind, gentle man that he was, to have to go through that experience at such a young age. And so many atrocities he had to face, including almost dying himself from getting shot. So he wanted to portray that, the horrors of the war. He never glorified it. He would just paint what he felt and what he saw in his head, and he could easily just convey it onto the canvas, not thinking about what other people might think or what they wanted to see. It was always just about him. He even always said that it was like his diary. If anybody wanted to know his life, this is it. Just look at his paintings and it's all right there. So he would incorporate people he knew or stuff going on at the time in the news or pop culture. He was just, whatever was going on at the time or mood he was in, if it was dark, he'd paint something depressing. He was influenced by several different great artists. Uh, Louisiana artist Clementine Hunter was a folk artist and he loved her work and he was inspired by her as far as the simplicity of her style and I guess maybe going back into reading about her and learning about her background and learning where she's from. Simple life here in Louisiana, South Louisiana, just like him. When I moved to a town called Donaldsonville, I met a great artist named Alvin Baptiste, folk artist. I said, Dad, hey, Alvin lives here in this town. My dad says, I'm a fan of Alvin's. Him and my father are friends and Alvin's a friend of mine now. Picasso, one of his favorites, a surreal artist, is Spanish. He heavily influenced my father. As far as the uh, unique shapes and, and the images, when you, you take two steps backwards, you can step back and look at it and you'll realize that this image is um, pretty. So, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a very, very big influence in his work. The Catholic religion has always been a very important part of my family. And you will notice Catholic religion in majority of his work. He was so excited, pastimes. You'll notice Billy Cannon, LSU icon. My father loved LSU sports, and he just started painting under the interstate, and he started painting these LSU players. Uh, very exciting times for LSU. What my dad told me is that the owner of pastimes came out, once he saw him out there painting these murals under the interstate, and he says, you know, I'd like you to do a piece of work in here. My dad was excited. He said, everybody would know his pastimes this is a good place. So he went in and he painted. And he painted Billy Cannon. He painted the LSU. And he threw in the Louisiana style, the, the alligators here, the alligators there. Charles painted a lot of murals around Baton Rouge that he spent his own time, his own money, and everything painting these things. And two of the major influences on that were the African-American community and LSU football. 
And for the LSU football thing, as with anybody that knows Charles Barbier, he loves LSU football so much. Like they say, you bleed purple and gold, he did. He would not miss a game. And as for the African-American community, I think him growing up in Plaquemine, he had said watching them getting treated unfairly and getting treated less than other people, he wanted to bring that to light and to show the beauty that they had to offer and also the inhumanity that they were dealt. After Katrina, we were both affected by how the horrors and the tragedy of it all, especially the response to the people that were in trouble. So he kind of drew out the grid of it and had one little square filled in where he had painted it, which I believe it might have been Charmaine Neville. And so he would do a square, I would do a square, he would do a square, and I would do a square. Then we collaborated on the center together. I think he liked to work and collaborate with other people because he really just enjoyed being around other people. He thrived off of the youthfulness because he painted a lot with younger people and he was so young at heart himself, playful and had that youthful spirit. It didn't matter to Charles whether you were an experienced painter or somebody that never painted before, it wouldn't make a difference. But he did like to hold back. If he's painting with somebody else, he wouldn't paint to his level on your stuff. And he even told me that. I was like, Charles, why don't these look like the ones in your paintings? He says, because I'm saving that for me. <laughs> I believe if I have a title, it's that we had the first show of our collaborative work together. And it was called Temptation in the Garden. My favorite painting is called Dylan's Dreams. My name is Dylan, Dylan Paul Barbier. <laughs> It's a painting where you have Bob Dylan in the centerpiece and you have the Beatles. It's somewhat surreal. It's not just a still life image. Carney's Two is my personal favorite work of Charles's. It's a work from a series that he'd done around 2010 that focused on Carney's and carnival settings. Not just Carney's, but every kind of individual you can imagine, but against the backdrop of a carnival. The colors are incredibly bright and vibrant, and he had signature pieces of imagery you can find in there. The, the police helicopter, the girl with the blonde hair holding up one hand, the snake at the bottom. There's a lot in there, a lot to digest, and a lot to dissect. Charles was an artist that was incredibly beloved in this community, but more than that, he wore many hats. He was a father, he was a mentor, to many artists, to many people outside of visual arts. He was a veteran, he was a prom king, a basketball player, so he had an incredible life. I'm forever glad that his art was part of it and that his art was allowed to be a part of so many other people's lives. Tired of lounging around watching the world go by? There's no excuse for that because Louisiana is always brimming with cultural events and attractions. Here's a list of some cool exhibits, performances and festivals coming soon to a town near you. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. Here's one for all you cat people. We're leaving Louisiana now for a trip to Columbus, Ohio, where one will find Wolfgang Parker. A fixture on the Columbus music scene for years, Parker recently traded his mic for a pen, and now he has set out to write and illustrate a series of books for young readers. His third book, in the Crime Cat series, features an eight-year-old superhero who solves mysteries with the help of his team of cat detectives. Um, I have 19 nieces and nephews who all live out of state, and uh, I wrote the first Crime Cats book for them as a holiday gift. Crime Cats is a series of children's mystery novels for ages 8 to 12. They are, take place in Columbus. 
and they're about an eight-year-old superhero who solves mysteries with the help of his two cat detective partners. Those cats are named Cat Bob and Neil Higgins. Down here, child, the voice called. Jonas followed the voice down to a one-eyed cat that squatted before him. You, he gasped. You can talk? Not to my knowledge, Neil answered. At least I've never verbally communicated with a human before. But somehow you can understand me. The books uh, delve into obscure Columbus history. So the second book, The Duesenberry Curse, uh, it is about the fact that Columbus was once home to the largest amusement park in America. And the newest book, The Deadly Scarab, uh, explores Columbus's real-life connection to the unearthing of King Tut's tomb. I chose the cats to write about for my nieces and nephews because I go on walks through the neighborhood uh, almost daily and I have made friends with all of these indoor-outdoor cats. And so when I was trying to think of something to write about for my nieces and nephews, I thought I'd like to share something personal, something personal that I normally would never make any art about. I've been a musician, a recording artist, I guess, for the last roughly, I guess, 20 years. We recorded the very first punk swing album, and the remnants of that band uh, is now a band called Weed Haven Laughing Academy. Uh, I'm kind of experiencing now, at the age of 40, like a rebirth artistically, both as a writer now and as a musician as well. But writing for kids was not something that I ever aspired to. It wasn't something I, I set out to, to necessarily do. I did not know how to lay out a book. I had to learn to do that. Um, I hadn't drawn in 20 years, so I had to kind of practice to start drawing again. My main concern was writing something for my nieces and nephews. I wanted to impart wisdom uh, to them that would help them uh, develop as, as people. Uh, and I wanted to uh, give them a kind of uh, pointers and insight into interacting with cats. Because I, I cannot uh, discount the effect that cats have had in my life. Which I know sounds like weird and corny, but it's true. Uh, my cat Sasha appears in this newest book, in the third book, and I gave her a little cameo in that uh, because I was afraid that if she found out that she was not in any of the books that I would have an accident going down the stairs one morning. In the back of each of the Crime Cats books there's a section called uh, Cat Clues, and cat clues are helpful tips to make you a better cat friend. And so this is one way of, uh, for kids and adults to maybe uh, set off on the right foot or paw, as it were, uh, uh, to have, uh, to create, a, a, I guess, a, a more enriching experience and relationship with the cats in their life. There's nothing like a parade to bring a community together and in Trinidad, Colorado there's been a parade of art cars rolling the city streets for years now. Think of it as a mobile gallery open to anyone who wants to drive their creation down the parade route. The automobile is canvas. What could be more American than that? Art Ocade's organizer is here to tell us more. <laughs> I love the crazy rides. In fact, I feel like mine is lame compared to compared to the great ones. It's showtime, people! Arnicate 2014 Roll! There's a lot of humor. It's an awesome place. Rodney Wood. Art car, oh man. Organizer, if you want to call that organization. The boss. <laughs> the boss. The boss, yeah. Head lunatic. Why did you decide to bring the art car parade to Trinidad? I was actually hired by the tourism board to create a signature event that puts Trinidad back on the map for fun. So be careful what you wish for, and here we are. And I've been doing a couple art car parades, I loved it. I had no idea I'd be in charge of one. But so that was a couple years ago, and this is our second actual parade. That's a bicycle! So 
the rules are you have to be able to drive it. If you can't drive it, it's a float, and that's the end of the rules. So there's not a lot of rules. Then I think the most important rule looking around is make sure you're having fun. Have fun. That's actually in our mission statement. <laughs> it's not just an illusion, that's a goal. So that's why we're here. Were you hesitant at all? You're going to bring it to Trinidad. It's a smaller place. I don't do hesitant. <laughs> The impact it has in, that, in this community is so much bigger because it, you know, it's taken over the town. I like your low rider. I like the sparkly one. You get a little bit weird on this car, but that's part of the fun. You know, we make people smile and we like to travel, so it works out really good. And you know, because we are so isolated from the big city, that even, it's one thing to be a little city, it's another to be that far from a big city. So, anything goes. And really about opening up art to everyone and, and everyone anyone. Counts. Anybody can play. If you can play, you're in. It's awesome. If you take yourself too seriously, probably not. I only have art for you. Challenges your idea of, uh, what a vehicle is. A vehicle just takes you to another place and that's what this does for your for your heart and your mind. We wouldn't leave you without introducing another of the treasures that make Louisiana a great place to be. If folks somehow seem to celebrate with more panache in years gone by, you'll be glad to know that in Lake Charles, people are recapturing some of that old time magic holding events at Calcasieu Marine Bank. Adley Cormier explains why this century-old building is again attracting people who want to celebrate in style. This is the Calcasieu Marine National Bank, and we're in the Great Banking Hall. This building was constructed in 1928 in Lake Charles, and it was a wonderful example of the work of Favreau and Lividay, the prolific and very, very accomplished architects from New Orleans. Now the building itself is limestone and the front of the building features limestone and bronze and it's in a sort of a restrained uh, revival style, a sort of a combination of Roman and Egyptian revival styles. It has uh, wonderful arched windows, it has stone medallions of the pioneers of Calcasieu Parish, the Indian and the Spanish explorer and the French explorer and uh, the building is crowned with the symbol of Calcasieu Parish, the eagle. And the eagle is a motif not only on the exterior of the building, but also here in the interior. It tops all of these wonderful columns in this great banking hall. Now this was a working bank for years and years and years. And when it was replaced by a newer building in the 80s, the bank was converted into a, essentially an event center and also a very secure office building. This great hall is constructed of something called xerotherm, which is unusual. It's a stone-looking product that is manufactured from Louisiana bagasse, which is a residual material from the processing of sugar. And the xerotherm, I don't think they make it anymore, the xerotherm looks like stone and works like stone, but it's warmer, it's quieter, it allows us to actually talk at a reasonable level in this big stone looking hall. The building itself is one of the showpieces in downtown Lake Charles. It's still a working building and it still has a great use. It's the venue for hundreds and hundreds of very successful weddings. I promise you that that you won't get divorced if you get married to Calcasieu Marine. And uh, it's uh, full of wonderful, beautiful, absolutely first-class details, uh, bronze and iron and wonderful use of stone. It features some very, very secure bits and bobs. The vaults in this building are exceptionally secure. And the safe deposit vault was the third largest construction by Mosler Safe Company in the world, the third largest safe in the world. There was that much money in Southwest Louisiana. And one of the unusual features is that the fabulous clock, which is the showpiece of the, the hall, the actual focal point as you enter the building, Behind it, it's a, a bullet 
bulletproof piece of glass designed in 1928 to protect the building from being robbed on the rough chance that it was, although this building was never robbed, thank God, knock on wood, but it protected the telephone operator who could call for the police almost instantaneously. She sort of surveyed the entire banking floor and any miscreants she was able to respond to instantaneously. Well, it was expensive in, in its day. Of course, it's the sort of construction that you don't see nowadays. Uh, it's built to last the centuries, and it did. It was designed to show that, that this particular bank was going to protect your money no matter what. It was an assurance in the 20s. It was a period of great optimism, and it served as a bank through the Depression. And in fact, the, uh, the person who sort of piloted the bank through the Depression, a fellow by the name of W.T. Burton, who was very, very big in Southwest Louisiana history, managed to save the money of his investors. And uh, his, his, he actually um, did everybody right. He did his investors right as far as protecting their money during the dark days of the Depression. But he came through the Depression, went through World Wars II, uh, and uh, the, the recovery after that, and was part of the great prosperity of Southwest Louisiana during the heyday of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The Calcutta Marine Building, uh, uh, all parts of it were renovated and restored, including the garage, the enclosed garage to the back of the property, which was contemporary with the building being constructed in 1928. The Richards have redone it, refurbished it as an event center called the Paramount Room, named for the Paramount Movie House, which once stood very near to that particular building. And the Paramount Room provides an alternative to the very fancy, great banking hall, slightly more down home, if you will. So the friendly garage has been restored as well as the, the main part of the building. It's part of a complex that includes a courtyard and a gazebo and a pavilion and a rotunda, which is all part of the Calcutta Marine National Bank building in downtown Lake Charles. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But never fear, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And meanwhile, Country Roads Magazine makes another great resource for learning what's going on in the arts all across this state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.